Uh, you're, you did a uh, Bachelor of uh, Science in Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics at University of Pennsylvania, um, a Master of Science at UC Irvine in Mechanical Engineering with an emphasis on robotic mechanical systems, uh, and then a PhD at Stanford University, uh, also in Mechanical Engineering. And you uh, had an NSF NATO fellowship in uh, Italy, Italy subsequently, which sounds really interesting too, um, centered around advanced robotics. Um, so you've had various faculty appointments. Um, you've been at Penn for about a decade, uh, it seems, which is- Time flies. <laughs> time flies. You're active in uh, IEEE, um, this, the engineering society, and specifically in robotics and automation um, and several other societies. And we're, we're really thankful that you've expressed interest and commitment to join our uh, T32 training program as faculty. So we're very excited about that, actually. Um, clearly, you've been uh, well-funded with, with grants, and they seem to center around both research and, and tech development, actually, um, and similarly to the, to the publications that you've um, been successful in, which include peer-reviewed manuscripts and chapters, and you have several patents, too, which is terrific. So. We're very excited to have you here to present to us today. The title of your talk is Robot Assisted Therapy Should Adapt to Both Cognitive and Motor Impairment Levels to Improve Functional Outcomes. So thank you very much and we look forward to your talk. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. I know Shalish tried to invite me two years ago, Shalish, and it just was not working. And this time I actually thought I was gonna be there in person and then this happened. But I really appreciate um, kind of beginning to foster closer ties uh, with Moss Rehab. Actually, while I was here, someone was, I was talking to the Tyro Motion people and they were like, all our stuff is with Eskenazi in Moss. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> You're like, you guys got to go see them. Anyway, um, so my just uh, just a few housekeeping. I do have some financial disclosures uh, regarding I'm going to talk about some work related to one of the robots that we are in the process of trying to commercialize through a spinoff company called Re Recupero Robotics. So I just wanted to make sure I disclose that. Well, you guys are all familiar with stroke, but I'll just do um, kind of the, the, the typical speech spiel, which is 800,000 people getting strokes per year. It's a very expensive um, process and essentially um, one that only will escalate. And unfortunately, even despite rehab and, and, and advancing medicine, 25 to 75% of stroke survivors are still dependent there are lots of long-term impairments that persist after stroke, cognitive impairments, 46 to 61%. will have deficits in across the board, language, um, visual, spatial, executive function, memory. We'll see a lot of um, motor dysfunction, 60, 65%, maybe even more. Psychosocial issues, as well as um, impairments on activities of daily living. So all that essentially contributes. And the, the challenge is when we think about going forward in time, you know, a lot of people are projecting that in 2050, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. And so of course they'll be more at risk for stroke. And then we see uh, all these other issues that are happening, infectious diseases, non-infectious diseases. So I think in this atmosphere of just there's a growing number of people living with disabilities. And in the same atmosphere, though, is a shortage of clinician. And I don't know if that's going to um, get any better anytime soon. It really brought, to me, COVID just brought that front and center. We saw just what happens when there's an overwhelming number of people who need care and just not enough um, clinicians and it stresses our health system. So there's essentially a gap in care and in that space is where um, technology can help to bridge this gap. And that's kind of the philosophy of our lab in terms of focusing on therapeutic and assistive robot type technology, developing them, using them to try to understand impairment. Um, the, the uh, you know, back in the 1990s when this began, 
Um, and and I was a part of the one of the few labs in the country to stand, uh, that were doing actual development work in therapeutic robotics. And I remember that it actually began within the stroke population, and this, and then it kind of went to cerebral palsy, and then now it's it's you know with a, a variety of populations. And one of the first um, thing was trying to automate or and deliver autonomously and semi-autonomously um, functional therapy primarily began with the arm, then the leg, and then now joints. Now we're into mental health therapy, social robots, the, 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 the huge gamma. And I think a critical thing um, about these therapy robots is also to assess level of disability and impairment. Um, and it was primarily focused on motor outcomes. Um, when you'll see these robots mostly in clinics and in supervised settings, not enough of them are, are actually in homes or in the community. And that's uh, also a big issue or a big something that my lab is also concerned with from a development standpoint. Um, I always like to put this slide up. But one of the things that we've been studying and trying to model is robot patient interactions with the premise that the robot is sharing the control with the therapist. And so kind of understanding how the robot plays a part um, in the three main roles that we've observed um, with um, therapists and a paper that just came out in, in the International Journal of Social Robotics kind of uh, looked at some of the, the work that we did with a, an occupational therapy colleague in looking at and analyzing um, stroke uh, robot patient interactions during a stroke rehabilitation task. Some things we observe was that therapists often might take on three big roles, the demonstrator, observer, and helper. And when it's almost dyadic, so when the therapist is the demonstrator, the patient is the observer, patient, uh, therapist, observer, patient's the performer. And then when the therapist is a helper, the patient's being helped. And I want the robots, um, when we're thinking about them, to sit in the middle of these type of um, encounters to provide um, assistance to, um, to the patient as well as to the clinician. When you look at the, the systematic review or you kind of look at what, what's been done, there's been a lot of helper robots, um, robots that I would say the early MIT Monus, if many of you are familiar with, which is now like in motion and it's now being bought by Bionic, would be considered what I would call a therapy robot. And the specific robot that I'm talking about today is one of our low um, degree of freedom systems, TheraDrive, and that would, consider, would be considered a helper robot. There's demonstrate and observer role, uh, robots in terms of assistive and service robots. Our lab also does work in that uh, venue, thinking about affordability, remote tele-rehab and, and assessment. There's, I think, uh, more and more work being done is how can robots be more fluid in transitioning between these different types of roles. I don't think there are lots of successful robots that are doing that yet, but I do think that more and more people are thinking about the need to have more versatile systems, but they don't always have to be humanoid in nature. Um, oops, looks like my video is not working, but this is, this is an example of Adler. Um, that is one of the first systems that we worked on. It's a haptic master robot. And the idea here was that we would be supporting um, and designing the control algorithms that allow us to support a stroke survivor helping with a drinking task. And I, my lab has always been focused on real tasks. And so we've had an affinity to occupational therapists and trying to understand the dynamics of task-oriented type uh, work. Um, looks like, apologize for none of the videos seem to be working. Um, the, this is another system that we've been recently developing. I just graduated my PhD student who's been kind of taking charge of how do we develop an affordable social assisted robot um, where it's a telepresence platform augmented by a humanoid. And so in this, in this sense, it's kind of looking at how do we um, make tele uh, rehab or remote um, assessment more possible and more feasible. And then we also kind of work on the state of the art systems like uh, the Baxter and looking at humanoids as are these the robots of the future? And if they are, what, what can you do with them? And things like that. The pros and cons of rehab therapy robots, 
there, there's some really great pros, and I think many of you are already aware of them. We can do the high-intensity therapy, repeatable, adaptable, um, enabling the semi-autonomous training, can be consistent, repeatable, intensive, objective measures. That's, I think, for me, the key, one of the key things I'll be talking about today. Um, and we've seen mostly that it's comparable with conventional therapy um, when the doses match. Some of the, the, the downsides, high costs, complex, huge system sizes, accessibility is often an issue when we think about low resource settings. Um, they don't really have access. We still have these robots limited in mostly high income countries. And, um, and, and there's, I think fundamentally, there's still an issue with transfer of, of therapy within the robot system to ADLs. And I wanna draw attention to that because actually it's within that context that I make the statement that we should be kind of thinking about and maybe even trying to adapt both cog and motor um, control strategies during therapy. Why did I say that? And I think most of you who are, if you're on this call and you're a clinician, you already know that. And you're like, why is it taking you so long to figure that out? <laughs> that the that ADLs, um, when we think about basic ADLs, they may have a higher physical um, part to it, but there's some cognition involved. And then when we think of instrumental ADLs, like cooking, cleaning, housekeeping, cooking, you know, laundry, shopping, those actually have higher degrees of cognitive um, component to them. There's this interesting study that I found um, that made one of the studies that got us thinking about this issue is the someone went through and looked at um, a group in China and they were looking at physical and cognitive domains of instrumental activities of daily living. And they were kind of trying to understand what percentage or could we, could we quantify or try to the relationship between cognitive functioning and the, the type of tasks that people were doing. And they, um, they were able to break this down and they looked at the correlation between the mini mental exam and if a task was primarily more physical than cognitive or more cognitive than physical and how did that relate to cognitive assessments. And so actually then began to think about, well, how, what are the type of tasks that we're, we're using uh, with the robot? And is that the reason why when we see these gains in motor performance and we see then the, you know, the, the delta on the Fugelmeyer that we don't see transfer to ADLs. And one of the other thoughts in thinking about it is when we train, we train in a very controlled environment. You're, you're you know, training on the robot doing these motor activities and, and we experience success. But when you go into the real task, are you even doing the same task that you got trained on in the lab, the cognitive demand gets higher. You maybe have to eat while you're watching TV, while you're talking to your family members. And all of a sudden the cognitive demand, it becomes a dual task paradigm. It becomes where you're trying to, you're competing. Um, and so the motor performance might be affected by these cognitive um, um, activities that are happening or that you're trying to engage in. So one of the things that we then started saying that most, when we looked at the robot assisted therapy environment, most people are focused on the, the X axis. If you think about this as an axis, thinking about um, we are looking at people with high impairment to people with lower impairments. And we're, we're, we're trying to, if X axis is the Fugelmeyer or type of motor um, scale, we'll have those with um, higher impairment here and those with lower impairment here. And then when we think about, then said, well, if we then divide and, and put a y-axis to it, um, loosely thinking, I'm an engineer, so I tried to put everything on a graph, um, thinking that then the those with high impairment, you know, we then said the y-axis, those with high impairments are here and those with low impairment, what is what's happening in the in in terms of like care in terms of rehab robotics? So if we then say the folks over here um, are 
the people that are mostly recovered, you know, and so we don't necessarily train a lot of them. And then when we think about the more the people, the moderate to high functioning is kind of, um, excuse me, the moder moderate to highly severe are the types of patients that we would normally train on robotics. And when we think about, and we, we did the, a study, an anecdotal one, but then someone went ahead and, and um, published on it, most of robotic systems excluded people that had anything more than mild cognitive impairment. And oftentimes it wasn't even mentioned or wasn't even measured. Cognitive impairment appeared to not even be um, a part of the radar or part of the discussion. I know why. In the beginning, we were all afraid that if people don't react well or people couldn't understand, they wouldn't be able to do the ro robotics. Um, but now that's not the case. Now we've gotten to be better at developing these systems. So how do we then deal with um, people that are more than mild or cognitively impaired? And when you think about what's happening, there's lack of effective strategies for people that have high cog and high motor impairment. And then most of the time when people have um, high cog impairment, but low motor impairment, you put them, you focus on VR or, or cognitive rehab type techniques, et cetera. So one of our goals was to try to think about how do we understand breaking people up into this strategy and then how do we build effective rehab strategies over here? So these were some of the main, you know, the, 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 the big um, clinical trials that have been done. And when you look at the, um, at the scores, most of the time people were considered just mild or no impairment or nothing was reported. And the systematic um, review was done where they looked at 66 upper limb robotic assisted trials and found that um, 10 enrolled participants with some impairment, mostly mild, and only five of them bothered to quantify cognitive impairment. So first, we, um, in, and this is primarily the work of one of my PhD students, uh, Kevin, who graduated last year. And at first we said, well, is it important? Should we even be thinking about it? And is that why um, the, the motor performance, we're not just seeing that transfer as well? So we started first with looking at the impact. So we want to examine whether robot tasks required a lot of cognitive ability, and if they did, what domains were involved. So we start by assessing um, both motor assessment, motor, um, um, we use motor assessment, standard clinical measures, the Fugelmeyer, boxing block, and grip strength. And then we also looked at the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Most of you are familiar with the MOCA. Um, the, it has uh, specific domains that it's looking at visual spatial executive function, naming, memory, attention, language, abstraction, and delayed recall. And so what we um, wanted to do, so we took, uh, we had a cross-sectional study where we measured patients on the MOCA and then on the box and block, which is kind of a, a measure of motor activity, but then we also did the Fugelmeyer, a measure of motor impairment. Oh, this one works. This guy's random. <laughs> in terms of what uh, what will work today. <laughs> um, so so at least it's working when it's when it's more critical, right? Um, so then the robot based task that we we had published on in the past was this preview tracking task where there was a um, a simple task where the where the 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 track um, the that you are the trail that you're supposed to be tracking was shown to you and was scrolling down. And then your goal was to move the robot handle so that you would keep um, the, the triangle green or tracking this object. And the square represented the percentage of error that we were giving you a hint at that we wanted you stay on. The primary metrics we used was mean performance error. We used a normalized um, mean distance traveled. Essentially, that means that we were looking at the dis what you actually did versus the trajectory and used a root mean squared error. And then we looked at the, the actual distance that you traveled 
um, which essentially looks at the, 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 the position, um, the full position of the trajectory. I don't know if this will work. Nope, that one's not working. <laughs> um, so I in this study, we, yes. So Julie. is this, I'm just wondering if this was, they were moving the handle back and forth or was so it? They were moving the handle. So if you see here, they were moving the handle back and forth, yes. And, and that back and forth movement would move the cursor in. So I was, I'm thinking about there's a transformation that's required. Yes, there's a, there was yeah. a, right. So the task, um, in fact, we have them do this task in lots of different uh, orientation, but in this particular orientation, it required a mapping from okay. this movement. From this plane to, to that plane. Right. Okay. Exactly. And that's, that's going to involve some level of computer. Uh, yes. And uh, so in fact, um, when we do this um, task, we do it two ways. We do a very, they can, we, right now we're doing 15, um, 15, uh, 15 second tracks. And, and so there's some learning and then we look at the overall learning. In one way, they, um, one task, the initial task, they were doing this task for 15 minutes. So we then looked at the, 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 it, then it was looking at like how they learned on the last task and not the first task. And that was what was determining the mean performance error. Any oh, other question? You. Yes. Okay. So with this population, we had 16 males, 15 females, age about 57 um, on average, plus or minus about 9.9 um, <laughs> years. Uh, we had essentially equal right hand and, and left hemi um, in terms of uh, performance. Uh, average uh, Fugelmeyer score um, was 48. So they were in that moderate group, but we had people that were lower um, and, and some that were in the mild. And then the MOCA was considered a mild, but we did have a few more than, um, you know, towards pretty much firmly within the mild. Uh, unfortunately, I think when we did this, we weren't focused on, because we were recruiting convenient sampling, we were just measuring whatever people had. And, um, and that's kind of what, what the outcomes were. Uh, relatively, you know, this was the grip strength and then the box in box score. So first, what we did was um, using a cutoff as 48 for this particular um, and then we calculated the visual, the visual executive functions uh, MOCA score. We divided people into that two axis system. I know I, and we recognize that you could be finer grained. You could have, you know, um, no, no impairment, mild, moderate, and severe, but we decided to kind of have this big grouping initially. So the, just to uh, bring your attention to the graph, the x-axis is the Fugelmeyer, the cutoff score 48, we said was essentially going, the people above this were mild to no um, impairment and people below were more severely impaired. And then above the 3.5 on just the visual executive function subscore, we use that to say people um, above that were mildly um, uh, impaired in terms of COG and then people below that were um, substantially impaired. So if you notice that we had basically people in all the groupings. And the assumption um, that many people have is that most of the people are above this line and not many people kind of look at the folks below this line. So this is an example of the result in the tracking task. The, the dashed line is the actual display trajectory that they were asked to track. The grouping, so let me go back here just so you, right, so this, this group here is that high functioning group, remember? The group all over here is that group that we said was high cog function, um, low um, moderate motor impairment, these were people who were moderate and moderate, and then people who were moderate um, cog, but um, low function, um, high function. Sometimes I like the, the, the impairment versus function thing, you'll see me switching back and forth. <laughs> Hopefully I don't confuse you. 
So we separate the people into um, the, the subjects within these four sectors. And you could see that what was expected was that those with mo moderate and you know impairment in both the motor and cog, we saw them kind of having very poor tracking ability. Those that had um, that were low impairment on both, we saw definitely higher um, tracking ability. And then what I think was was quite interesting is that, and this is just an exemplar here, where you see then that those with moderate um, low uh, impairment and and vice versa, this for th this particular subject that we we chose here had some you know actually decent tracking, but you'll see in terms of how the performance process comes out in the metric, what what was happening. Then when we what we did was we said. Um, there are three performance metrics that we were looking at. Um, predicted normalized distance. This is the actual normalized distance. That's the, 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 the metric that we got from our robot measure. We were looking at actual performance error, meaning the, the accuracy in the tracking. And then we also decided to look at mean, mean velocity. How fast were you moving the wheel? Sometimes um, the speed, uh, indicates confidence in terms of how you were tracking. So this is the mapping um, and of the grouping. You see that we had uh, the primary that low um, impairment group were, were essentially had higher normalized distance, they had lower error, and then they had higher velocity. We see that the, the, the middle group here were kind of, uh, we expect with the mild cognitive impairment and low to moderate function, you see that they were a little bit lower than that other group, maybe not significantly below. And then we see that um, that group with the moderate motor um, uh, function and low cognitive impairment we, we, we get a, a, a pretty high distribution. I think one of the, the key takeaways is how, what type of score caused us to, you know, predict a performance error score. So this is the actual robot score. What were the, the, the coefficients that caused us, that allowed us to then predict the performance score with a relatively high R squared? So we saw here for performance error that the executive function MOCA score was very much involved visual spatial. And that made sense. You know, it made sense that there was uh, visual spatial tracking and that then there was box and block was actually a major predictor of the accuracy. When we came to, to looking at the distance travel, the Fugelmeyer actually turned out to be a better predictor, as well as there was the executive function score. And when we when we look at the mean velocity, that was a better predictor. So interestingly enough, what we recognized here was different metrics that we use in robot assisted therapy may actually be better at understanding different aspects of motor or different aspects of cognitive function. And that maybe, um, and then we further looked at this here by saying the performance error was able to distinguish between, excuse me, the high functioning group, the, the very, very high functioning group, and the looking, distinguishing between the cog, the cognitive level, those that was, had low cognitive impairment and moderate. And it was also able to distinguish between the those that have low, um, the, between the low and the moderate cognitive. So this was more effective in, in parsing out the cognitive people. But when we look at the normalized uh, tr uh, tr uh, tracking, um, the, the normalized distance travel, excuse me, this score was more kind of looking at the moderate function. And you can see that low motor, moderate motor was able to distinguish that better than, and was not able to really tell much difference between the cognitive difference groups. So, the, so essentially what the take home measure, measure for me here was one robot-based task involved 
significant amount of visual, spatial, and executive function. And I think a lot of our tasks are tracking type tasks. And then also that kinematic metrics from this task can differentiate between cognitive and motor functional groups differently, meaning that we need to be careful as to what measures we're picking when we're saying we're going to use this measure to be quantitative for um, our to describe what's happening in the robot environment. The, the next question that we asked was, can we capitalize on this particular phenomenon and quantify both cognitive and motor impairment? And can we quantify the effects of cognitive impairment on motor performance consistently? And the goal is, if we can do this on the fly, then we may be able to adapt um, what's happening during robot um, therapy sessions to where people are cognitively and motorically. So this led us to actually doing a study where we were looking at people with HIV and HIV and stroke. And many of you might go, well, what's going on? Why did you end up <laughs> looking at HIV? Turns out we were interested in our a group in Botswana and we were working heavily with stroke survivors there. And a third of the stroke survivors in Botswana also had HIV. So that actually led us to begin to look at um, the sensitivity in robot-based measures in, in those that are HIV positive, but also with a stroke. And we, we actually repeat this study with the stroke survivors, but that um, data is still being processed. So we wanted then to develop robot-based metrics that could assess patients for motor and cognitive dis disability and could themselves stratify patients by clinical scores. So kind of the opposite. Before we, we ran the robot task, then we measured the robot metrics and we say, well, what clinical scores could predict this metric? This time we're gonna do the inverse. We're gonna um, develop a robot task and then try to figure out uh, how we can predict the clinical metrics. So why HIV? Um, it's, a, it's beginning to be a chronic condition. Um, antiretroviral is, is something that's being used. We actually did first a study on the US population and we're actually repeating the study on the population in Botswana right now. Um, half of the people living with HIV are over 50 years old. And essentially what we also discovered is that HIV when it crosses the blood brain barrier leads to a, a lot of complications, CNS, um, CNS infections and results in both cognitive and motor um, disruptions. So it became a group that we could access relatively easy. Also, we wanted to, to, to do a study where we could then use the models to look at and examine our population that were in Botswana. HIV uh, results in long-term impairment, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, 40%, 70% have some dis dysfunction in the past. Most people looked at fine motor issues, but we were also trying to determine whether um, how much co uh, cognitive and, uh, excuse me, and gross motor um, issues were also involved with those with HIV. And then many people with HIV also report issues on instrumental daily living. Um, and this made us realize that this population actually was a really interesting population to study. So with HIV, we added a couple of, uh, a, a couple of things because with the, when we started looking at HIV, executive function was known to be compromised because of HIV, especially in HIV associated um, disorders, speed on information processing, as well as working memory. So we decided then to leave a couple of the motor assessments that we had before. We added the group pegboard because in most of the batteries with HIV, fine motor is, is highly affected. So we added a fine motor um, measure on the motor side. And then on the cognitive side, we added the international HIV dimension scale, but we also did the MOCA. And then we added these trail making tasks that have been used extensively with, um, with HIV, but also has actually been used with a, um, normal populations as well, aging. And then we added an information processing uh, cognitive assessment to, to understand kind of that impact as well. 
So this is the group pegboard task. If, if people are not familiar, it has a cognitive component to it because you not only have to find the peg and put it in, which is the physical part, but you have to orient the peg so that you can put it in the proper groove, which I think is why um, many of the studies that are looking at motor and cog will pick up the groove peg word task because it has both, um, both elements. Then we, this is the color trail essentially would be information processing and executive functioning. The color trails two is more mapped to um, uh, executive functioning. And we were basically trying to find a quick measure because the mocha is nice, but it's kind of long. So we, we added this because we also wanted to ultimately try to identify a quick measure of executive function. And the color trails task doesn't take very long. So we added that in in order to do some um, uh, analysis with it. So here, the metrics that we're using, time to complete, um, number of errors, et cetera. We kept the robot-based tasks. So everyone in the, in the, that we studied did this robot-based task as well, but we changed it. Now they did 15, 15 second tasks. So we can look at, um, there, there will be motor learning, et cetera, that will happen. We added this, um, cognitive task called the end back, which is essentially working memory. It doesn't require you moving the robot. It just requires us getting reaction time. So you're pressing a button. So I call it robot based, but it's really just adding the button so that we can collect it with the robot. <laughs> but what is neat is this task that um, we develop based on the Corsi um, block task that is very traditional in um, psychological testing. And with the Corsi block task, they usually put the blocks on the table and then you're um, asked to uh, identify them or they, they um, the order and you, and you then need to pick up the blocks in the, pre the order that you see them as they're identified. How we modified this was essentially, you see a, a nine, uh, nine um, blocks on the screen and they light up. So if they, you get, if you're gonna uh, reach for three blocks, three of them line up in a particular order. And then you're asked to move the robot to the blocks that are lit up in the order that they lit up. So now you have a motor component as well as a cognitive component. What's important here is everyone starts at three blocks. And if you fail, it goes down to two blocks. If you pass, it goes back up to two. And it's an adaptive task until it figures out the span that you're able to remember and motorically complete in the, in the time given. So we're looking at the spatial span and, your, and the mean sequence length that you were able to do. This is the population that we looked at. Um, we had 15 people with HIV, six people with stroke. Um, if you, the, they were very comparable in terms of age, in terms of, of MOCA, in terms of HIV, uh, um, HIV dementia scaling and their boxing block score. A uh, little bit, the, the HIV stroke population was a little bit more impaired when you think about their non-dominant hand in terms of the boxing block. So this is just uh, me, us like using now um, a normalized Z-score. Uh, so we, we went away from the uh, Fugemeyer and we decided to use the boxing block. One, because the boxing block is more, um, the Fugemeyer is basically specific to stroke while boxing block could be used with stroke or HIV. So we kind of ended up pivoting to a motor activity score. And then we normalized that score. And this is now the Z score where we used minus two Z, uh, the Z score of minus two to determine the separation between moderate cognitive function and mild to normal. Uh, this is the plotting um, of distributing the, the patients uh, within the, the four quadrants that we talked about. Um, and you can see that the HIV patients were in all quadrants, um, as well as the, the, the HIV and stroke patients were 
primarily in the lower part, but, and I think that could just be the, the end that we had. Any questions? So this is one of the, the things that I thought uh, was one of the really interesting part of the study that we did. First, we looked at kind of the histogram of the distribution of what, so if I just call your attention first to this part, this is the, on the x-axis is the sequence length. And then on the, the y-axis is the relative probability in terms of what they were able to accomplish the different groups. So the group with no impairment or very mild impairment is the group in the blue. You can see that their, their whole structure is shifted over. And then the folks that are cog motor impaired only or cog impaired only or motor and cog, you see that the motor and cog group the with group with both were on the further side in that they were not able to remember and move to um, the same number of blocks. But the motor only and the cog only group, I think is really interesting is uh, they overlap each other. They sit on top of each other. And we weren't able to distinguish very well what was going on and separating out these groups. You see here another way to look at the, the activity where the this is across the 15 trials. You can see there's a little bit of a fatigue effect if we, because if we, you see even the people that did have mild impairment, their sequence length improved, improved, and then they, they got tired towards the end. So there is a little bit of fatigue effect in the task that we showed, but the, the separation, you can see that those with motor and cog stayed pretty low in terms of what they were able to guess accurately. And then the those with motor only impairment and cog only impairment had, um, they were sitting on top of each other. We then speculated that those with cog impairment and had really good motor and function, that group, they actually, their cog impairment masked their motor function. They were not able to complete the task, even though technically they had the motor function to be able to complete the task, they were not able to. So it appeared as if they were more impaired motorically than they were. So I think that's interesting. And, and, and one, of the, one of the things that we suppose then is the presence of cognitive impairment will you know, uh, prevent this, uh, this group from performing and, and, and disrupt their motor performance, which I think was known and is known by clinicians, but I believe that this is the first time that we're actually quantifying that within um, a robot-based type measure. We also looked at just whether, which metric was sensitive to the differences between the groups. Um, one of the things that we, we the, the memory, um, this is the NBAC task looking at memory performance. You can see that it was indeed sensitive to the cognition, which we, we, we saw, and that those with, that those with um, moderate uh, cognitive impairment on these side were significantly different in their work. So they had working memory impairment. Then when we looked at trajectory performance, um, this is more of a, um, the performance error recall has a little bit of cog as well as motor. You can see that it was able to distinguish between the low and moderate group, as well as um, these two groups. And then the, uh, the spatial span was most sensitive to being able to detect the differences across both motor as well as cog. So we were actually encouraged that this spatial span task that we developed could actually maybe be a, a stand-in for um, ability to separate out um, people into these different cognitive um, areas. We asked ourselves, were these metrics even valid? Could they predict clinical scores? Um, and so we looked at how what types of the metrics and what combination of the metric would be able to predict, for example, the color trail store. And color trails one is uh, information processing. So we saw that um, our tracking, trajectory tracking of normalized distance and the spatial span, um, the mean sequence length 
was the best predictor of color trails uh, one and the R squared was 0.6. And when we look at the literature, we, um, we most of what we're seeing is that in this case, it was a pretty strong predictor. Um, and we felt that this was, um, that those two, the, your performance on those two robot metrics would give us a good sense of your information processing. Then we also, information processing, we also looked at with a second measure, digital symbol coding. We also saw primarily the spatial span mean sequence length was more predictive of the digital symbol coding. We also looked at um, executive function. We saw a more of a moderate uh, relationship, R squared value, to um, cognitive scores in terms of executive function, the color trails too. We had an R squared of 0.36 and then uh, R squared of 0.45. And what is encouraging is that the spatial span mean sequence length was the only real predictor of those two of the executive function measure. And then we looked at gross motor function, which was the box in block. And we see that the normalized distance and the spatial span sequence length, again, had was a strong predictor of the motor function score. So what does that leave us? Essentially, what we're, we're thinking is with this particular, um, excuse me, with this, with the spatial span task, we were quite encouraged because we thought, well, here we lucked up on a, we didn't luck up on it, we, we did develop it. <laughs> My student was able to identify a nice uh, task that could be done by a variety of patients using the robot system that maybe on the fly could allow us to separate people into these particular quadrants and give us a sense of what strategy might be useful for a patient here versus a patient here versus a patient in this particular quadrant. And so if we can now on the fly, whenever you sit down, you do one of these tasks, maybe it's done weekly, maybe it's done um, at each session, then we could predict and, and adjust where you are in terms of your motor and cognitive function. And the cognitive function, I think that was most predictive was information processing, executive functioning. Um, then we could adjust or tune the activities that we're doing uh, um, in real time. So we're actually running um, a study now where we're trying to build gaming tasks that would take in a couple of these measures, uh, uh, take in the robotic measures on the fly and take in the clinical measures and try to adjust in real time the, the difficulty of the, of the gaming task as well as the difficulty of the robot, um, the adaptive nature of the, of the rope of the forces, the assistive or resistive forces. Excuse me. So before, uh, there's a lot of strategies that are out there that's doing in the loop adaptation for motor impairment. That's pretty much standard. Um, assist as needed strategies, adjusting um, due, due to phys physiological um, signals. We see that in the literature, um, EMG triggered type of adaption, but very few actually also consider the cognitive level while they're doing the adaption. So one of the things that we um, are looking to do is to automate, um, kind of have a, a confluence and where we're automating both depending on where people fall. And we're trying to get inspired by dynamic difficulty adjustment, which is what gamers use, where they basically look for where people are in terms of how they're doing well in the game versus um, whether they are um, whether they're getting bored or they're getting or they're doing really well and adjust to keep them at what they call flow, keep you in that flow zone. So we're trying to work with some colleagues to, to determine how we can develop therapeutic games that would require a robot, um, our, our simple robot or robot movements that would allow us to do 
cognitive difficulty adjustments, as well as our standard um, motor adaptation work that we normally do. We're actually looking at uh, the profile. We're collecting a lot of data on the patient. Um, we also started collecting physiological data, GSR, um, galvanic skin responses, heart rate, then their performance, and trying to come up with a methodology for adapting the motor and the cognitive um, play at the same time. So I'm going to just stop there because I know <laughs> probably uh, run out of time. Um, this is These are my sponsors. We're working in a variety of places um, to try and bring uh, this work, especially to HIV, um, which is a, a kind of a big push for ours right now. And we're collecting similar data here in the lab as well as there, but also looking at the stroke population here as well as there to see, is it something that would actually lead to better outcomes um, after robot assisted therapy for the upper extremity? My current students, and I thank you for your time. I wanted to make sure I had time for questions. Wonderful, thank you. Terrific talk. Okay, we can open it up for several questions. Maybe use the hand, uh, the hand, there we go, from Rachel. Oh no, that's a clap. Um, well, if just while we're waiting for people to put their hand up, can you hear me there, Michelle? Yes, I can. So just a couple of things to clarify. That was a very interesting talk and you covered um, quite a bit of ground there. So for the, and I like this, um, I like this unidirectional uh, robot, by the way. It's really it's, super Yeah, one robot. degree of freedom. <laughs> when I first saw the, uh, the movement, I was thinking it's, you know, they, they get stuck in this ellipse, the stroke patients, where they just go back, they just go from left to right. So I was glad that it was kind of in this functional forward and back. Does it depend on the amount of range of movement they have? I'm thinking for the stroke patient, um, working, you could do the same thing working through a small available range that might change as they get more movement back. I'm not sure how you deal with uh, Presumably, that's not an issue for the so, non stroke patients. So, in the um, assessment task, we, we have a essentially take care of the, the, uh, the inertia effects. So they're working the robot without dealing with uh, inertial effects. And we don't do dynamic range adaptation at that point because we wanna know what they can and cannot do for the, the particular task. So we don't adjust based on their range of functioning, but in the therapeutic exercise task, when we start using the game, we do do dynamic range adjustments so that they're able to enjoy the game within the context of what they're able to do. Excellent, thank you. I see a hand up from, uh, from Umi. Dr. Venkatesan there in the corner. Hi, Dr. Johnson, thank you for your mm. talk, it was great. Um, I had, a, I had several questions, I wish I'd written them all down, but I'll ask the most recent one that came to mind. It seems it's, or I, this probably wasn't the intention, but I got the impression that you, you know you were separating cognitive tasks from motor tasks um, to characterize them almost sort of mutually exclusively. But but I noticed that your cognitive tests have motor components in them, and your box and blocks is also time limited and has a cognitive component. So could you be seeing correlations that are just correlated to the same thing? Well, so you you're you're. It's interesting that you say that. So what we, we deliberately try to choose tasks that have a higher motor component, because we could argue that every task has a bit of cog and a little motor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the, so we, we try to um, choose tasks that were higher motor, mo needing more motor activity and little less cog and then those that required a higher level of cognitive activity, as well as a high level of motor. So for example, the spatial span task had both, almost like a, a, a grouping together. And then the tracking task had some cog, um, but was a lot more motor in terms of what was required. So we figured that by doing that, um, we could still um, have valid correlations. 
for example, the boxing block, you're right. But, but while the boxing block had um, a lot more, um, did have some um, cog, it didn't actually stack up very well to a lot of the cognitive measures. So when you look at boxing block and you looked at um, the visuals, the, just the clinical, because we also looked at like, how does boxing block relate to the clinical measures of, of information processing, et cetera. There wasn't a very high and significant um, uh, component. So we, we were very clear about making sure that the motor measures themselves were primarily motor measures and the cognitive measures were primarily cognitive measures. And when you looked at every, because we did, a, of course, we looked at how everything were related to each other <laughs> to understand whether, you know, the, the, whether there was a high correlation with the boxing block for information processing, and it wasn't. It was very high, it was correlated more with the motor measures, and then the cognitive measures were more correlated together. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Dr. Middleton, I see a hand up. Hey, um, Dr. Johnson, thank you for the, the talk. It was really interesting um, to really kind of, I love how you approach the problem to kind of delineate the, you know, different constructs, but how they relate to, to each other. Um, and I was wondering, because I don't think Laurel's here, but I was how your kind of your adapted Corsi block task um, you know, in this motor domain and in even the end back. And these are all kind of context free cognitive tasks, right? They're mm -hmm. bereft of any kind of semantic meaning. And so I was thinking about what you think about adapting this work to kind of more meaningful cognitive processing, like semantic processing or tools in action that actually relate to things that we interact with. It's a good, it's a good question, in fact, because it, it in a, in a sense, is we were working with a limited robot therapy environment. So, and deliberately so, because we wanted to transfer this particular robot to Botswana and, and a more complex robotic system is not gonna, they can't afford it and, and, and it's not really functional there. So in that context, we were trying to, you know, keep it, <laughs> keep it doable and, and make sense. But in terms of, how does that then relate to the real ADLs, which I think is what you're getting at. So when you do train on, 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 um, on the, this particular robot, then you go and you do your ADLs, there's still then a separation <laughs> between theoretical, you know, and back and trying to do memory tasks at home. I don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> Because I think at the end of the day, that's a part of why people are augmenting these types of therapies with virtual reality to give mm. people context. That's cool. uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is choose games that are related to real life so that there is more context. And in, in thinking about what we're doing next, which is developing games that are related to these contexts and then trying to do this adaptation of motor and cognitive levels within the game. Mm -hmm. So right now, this task did not have that. It wasn't, it wasn't a clear relationship, but we hope that with um, uh, our partner in terms of developing some tasks that are related to things that you do in real life, and then we can try to assess and adapt at the same time that we may get something um, closer to where we want to be, which is to get people, you know, to be able to transfer these skills better. I think I it's was, still a struggle. Yeah, because I was thinking that some of the, you know, cognitive measures that we use about, you know, concept processing or picture picture matching or such, they they might be more relevant than in, in mm -hmm. as you move in that direction. It's Thank funny you. you say that. Um, one of the one of my colleagues is a clinical psychologist and she was asking about, well, once you def define that someone has a cognitive issue, if, they're, if you identify that they have working memory, are you going to work on working memory while you're doing the robot task? Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying, what I thought, well, maybe within the robot setting, you can't do, you can do some of that, but you can't do all of it. Mm 
So what we may need to do is to add a cognitive rehab session onto the robot session so that we're not assuming that it was only mo motor issues that were involved. So we use uh, um, games or tasks with high content of both motor and, and cog, but we also add, I think, some deliberate cognitive rehabilitation activity that might be tuned to where they're having issues. So, so this picture picture and those types of more rich cognitive assessment or you know, therapy uh, activities could come into play as well. Folks, I, I see that we have a few hands up, but we're, we're out of time. So if you need to drop off, please drop off. Otherwise, um, and, we'll, and we'll say thank you. But for those who wanna stay around for a couple of questions, um, feel free to. So th just on behalf of the group, thanks very much, Dr. Johnson. And if you'd like to stick around for a couple of questions, please, please do. Yeah, so. I, can, I can stick around. <laughs> I, uh, I wonder if you could go back to your participants and see how many of them were actually driving. Mm, interesting. Okay. Because you think that would be would have a uh, relationship to whether they were able to do the task well. Yeah. See, yeah, that would be a real life test that uh, your paradigm reminded me of as they're moving uh, uh, along this path and you need to do move your path, you know, in a car. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I couldn't think of other ADL tasks that are like that because uh, you know I'm I'm limited in all the things uh, about instrumental ADL. I'm sure there is something like that. This mm -hmm. uh, uh, this paradigm reminded me of the old pursuit rotor. Even though you just have a one dimensional thing, but psychologists have for many many years used the pursuit rotor. Mm -hmm. the kind of measures you did. But driving yeah. would be a very important... Uh, Instrumental uh, activity of daily living. Right, yeah. and uh, it may be a, a test that could help people who teach driving uh, as to whether uh, the person should be a driver. Right now, it's mostly visual testing that they use, and then they take the person out on the road with a dual control car, and if the person doesn't drive too well, the other person, the helper, the helper robot, in this case, a human, puts the brakes on, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we we actually, the games that we're developing with this particular system, one thing that um, we that's unique about the third drive, and, and it's based in my paradigm of affordable robotic systems. And so it's, it's kind of thinking about a group of one degree of freedom robots that could be reconfigured in different ways. And so we actually flip that robot to um, a vertical setting and then use and then work on more kind of shoulder type activities where you saw this is kind of thinking more like shoulder elbow flexion, you know, activity, but then we also do more of an abduction adduction activity when we flip the robot up. And then we also change end effectors so that we can do internal external um, rotation as well as pronation supination. So while we showed that paradigm for the, for the assessments, um, the whole idea is that a simple robot when reconfigured could actually give you some of the same um, benefits as a more complex. And our strategy is that will this work more in developing countries or in low resource settings than having a you know a six degree of freedom robot or a humanoid robot that does everything. Brilliant, agreed, agreed. Yeah. Right, we'll take one more question. I think Josh, I saw your hand up. Uh, yeah, and it, it should be a quick question. Um, so I just had a question on the first experiment where, um, you had Fugelmeyer uh, be corresponding with a higher uh, velocity um, for the task. Why do you think that is considering Fugelmeyer isn't timed and it's just a test of ability rather than how fast one can accomplish something? Well, uh, it's a good question. I think, well, Fugelmeyer has a section where it looks at how you can move in and out of sy synergy. And it's mm -hmm. also about your, your control over your, your upper extremity in some sense. And so I think there is a relationship between you being able to move out of synergy, you be able to control better your, you know, in, in this case, a lot of shoulder um, 
uh, shoulder flexion and, and elbow extension, and that the, you're able to kind of switch back and forth very quickly. I think that's what it might be indicating from, and that the Fugelmeyer supporting that this person has more, um, you know, outer, they're able to have isolated um, muscle control. And mm -hmm. so they're able to switch back and forth very rapidly. Um, I think that's why there is a correlation and that the folks that had a little bit more of that control could do travel larger distances and at higher velocities. This is my take on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Well, wonderful uh, presentation again, and what a what a pleasure to to have you not physically here, but um, we're going to be next time. I'll make it physically. <laughs> I owe well. you guys a visit. <laughs> yeah. First, we'll come back to the U.S. But uh, okay. <laughs> so thanks again, and uh, thank you for the group for your great questions. Bye, thank everybody. you guys. Thank you for Bye, having Michelle. Me. Thank you.